friends. As long as the uh, pom pom girls next door are reasonably silent, we will we will get on with tonight's tonight's event. Uh, actually, I am both professionally and personally extremely delighted by the opportunity to introduce Bob Cohen. <coughs> I knew Bob when he had a full head of hair and it was a different color. Uh, when he was regarded as a coming scholar, I think it's fair to say that uh, uh, Bob Cohen is probably this generation's leading uh, scholar of inter international politics theory and international organization. I will not burden you considering the long flight that Bob has just been on from someplace to the west, and he knows not where he is now, someplace in the middle, on his way someplace to the east, uh, with a long listing of his publications and his other contributions to uh, our profession. Let me simply say that as a scholar of international relations, what is most striking about his work, in my view, is that if the traditional question to which theorists of international politics address themselves was why does conflict occur and what are the causes of war, Bob turned that question around. And I would argue that much of his work is dominated by a theme of why do things get done at all in world politics? I think many of us are struck uh, in view of the uh, numerous and repetitive uh, deadly conflicts which ravage humankind, that things do get done, whether the mail gets delivered, whether the goods get traded, uh, whether the local Toyota dealer gets stopped. Things do get done. And in fact, world politics is and has historically been dominated uh, by cooperation. But in the words of Thomas Hardy, war makes rattling good reading and peace is such a bore. Uh, I would argue that Bob Cohen knows much more about what I mean when I say peace than most of my colleagues in international relations. With little more ado then, uh, let me give you Bob, who's, who's going to chat with us tonight about a topic, the diplomacy of structural change, state strategies, and multilateral institutions in a post-Cold War world. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dick. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, I, I think you should worry, though, about the flattery of the introduction. I trust you know the story about the, the answer to the question of how many Harvard faculty members are needed to screw in a light bulb. The answer is one, to hold a light bulb while the world revolves around it. Um, actually, I'm, I'm from the Middle West. I was raised in Illinois, uh, a little town 10 miles from the Iowa border. I have a sister-in-law and brother-in-law in Des Moines, which is another reason for being here. So as I was telling uh, uh, Julie on the way out, it's, uh, you could tell you were in the Middle West from the, from the smell, the feel, the look uh, of the land, uh, even, uh, at, even at night. I'm going to talk about the diplomacy of structural change, uh, as, as Dick Monsbach said. I'm going to try to reflect on some of the uh, events of the last few months in context of what I think we know about international politics in the current era. Uh, well, when the world is changing with dazzling speed, as, as, as it has since 1989, the students of international politics have the opportunity and indeed the obligation to seek to use their theories to understand contemporary events. Indeed, that I think is the chief function of international relations theory. As, as Dick Monsbach has argued in his recent book, our theories are motivated by our values, affected by, by dramatic contemporary events, and therefore far from timeless, far from objective. Good theory helps uh, us understand our world and our lives. It may not help us understand all worlds and all lives, but it does not necessarily lead to cumulative knowledge. So I want tonight to interpret some elements of uh, of change in, in contemporary world politics, in the world we're living through now, uh, taking the risk that events will soon prove me wrong, which they probably will. I'm conscious that uh, when we offer contemporary analysis and policy advice, we must be humble. 
since during the last several years, we have failed to anticipate probably all the major changes in world politics, much less to evaluate how, how particular uh, policy actions would affect events. My excuse for talking about contemporary events is existential. That as human beings need to understand the conditions of their lives. Uh, and even if our theory is not very good, uh, it's the best we can do, it seems to me, to understand it. Well, the victory of the United States uh, and its allies in the war against Iraq has led to a spate of popular commentary about a new world order, as the President puts it, under the aegis of American military dominance or hegemony. And indeed, the United States' feats of arms have been impressive. They indicate that large, but technologically backward conventional armies are much less severe threats against an advanced fighting force than had previously been believed. They should not, however, be interpreted as meaning that military force can achieve political change or maintain the rule of unpopular governments within third world uh, countries, a lesson which the United States should have learned in Vietnam. Defeating conventional aggression can be achieved through massive air power, helicopter gunships, smart bombs, and air land battle doctrines, not to mention Storm and Norman. Uh, but governance, governance is an entirely different and much more difficult matter. The United States could force Iraq from Kuwait, but we cannot install coherent government in Baghdad or even in Kuwait City. It would be, it would be simplistic to assume that the military victory of the United States in, in the Persian Gulf implies that the United States is now once again number one, hegemonic in the term used by political scientists. Power depends not merely on military strength. It depends at least as much on economic strength, the attractiveness of one's, of one's ideas and economic system, and one's willingness to spend resources, or the public's willingness to spend resources, on foreign policy. For many purposes, securing cooperation from, from other advanced countries, ensuring growth in the world economy, cleaning the global environment, military strength is not very important at all doesn't buy you much. It serves better as a shield against domination by others than as a positive means of influence. In this lecture, what I want to do is to try to put some re uh, of the recent events into a broad historical perspective and to draw some conclusions for policy. And first, I will argue that if we view power more broadly than sheer military force, the past 30 years have witnessed not a concentration, but a diffusion of effective power resources. And the Gulf War does not change this long-term trend. This diffusion of power in world politics has two linked dimensions. First, the decline of the economic predominance of the United States, which has been going on for 30-odd years. And secondly, the expansion and globalization of interdependence, which has been going on for at least as long. I will talk about then about the, uh, about the transformation of political structure caused by a much more recent event without these long roots, uh, the collapse of Soviet power in Eastern Europe. Does this transformation mean that the United States can do what it pleases in world politics? Uh, I think not. Finally, I will draw some policy conclusions. Uh, I think we should have a, a cautious awareness of the limitations of American power, combined with an awareness of the possibilities for careful use of multilateral institutions to achieve our objectives. Uh, I worry about the phrase, the new world order. It reminds me of Voltaire's quip about the Holy Roman Empire, which he said it was neither holy nor Roman nor an empire. Uh, the new world order, I suspect, uh, will be uh, neither new nor worldwide uh, nor an order. Let me talk then first about the decline of the United States' economic uh, predominance. Uh, throughout the 1980s, political scientists argued about the changing configuration of world power. How concentrated are our world resources, power resources, and in particular, how dominant is the United States? Is the American share of relative power resources declining? And if so, at what rate? What is the relationship in, between tangible power resources and actual influence in world politics. 
And I think this debate has been somewhat over-dramatized. The United States, uh, and that the facts, in fact, are, some, are relatively clear, I want to make four, four major points. Uh, and they really basically add up to the point that the United States is not as dominant economically as it was 30 or 40 years ago, but it's still the world's leading economic power, and its relative decline has not been precipitous, at least not yet. Uh, my, four, my four specific points follow. First, even during the height of its economic ascendance in the 1950s and the early 1960s, the United States was involved in a bipolar military competition with the Soviet Union and was excluded by Soviet military power and political decision from significant access to Eastern Europe and much of continental Asia. The United States' dominance, therefore, was never global in scope. And we should remember that these golden years of American dominance weren't necessarily so golden from the point of view of the people living through them. Secondly, political scientists have sometimes exaggerated the ability of the United States in those years to exert effective influence over its allies. Uh, the United States did seek to determine the strategic direction uh, of policy and to induce its European, its, its European partners through uh, pro provision of material benefits to defer to its leadership. However, America was never able simply to dictate terms of the world. European influence was important in shaping a framework of economic interdependence and political alliance. U.S. influence over its allies uh, was limited by the U.S.'s own strategy, that is, to create a voluntary alliance of self-sustaining, independent democratic states uh, in Europe and in Japan. The U.S. was a powerful leader, and once in a while, as in the Suez Crisis, when the U.S. Uh, forced Britain and France out of out of Suez, it showed its muscle. But the U.S. could never dictate. Uh, if the U.S. ever had an empire, it was certainly an informal one, and I would suggest perhaps even a metaphorical empire. Thirdly, the decline of American material dominance since 1950 has been significant, but not precipitous. During the 1950s and, and 1960s, the United States controlled a remarkable portion of the economic or resources of the world. In 1953, the United States manufacturing production was almost double that of the next three leading producers put together. That is, double that of the Soviet Union, Great Britain, and Germany combined. And its gross national product, the U.S. GNP, was more than twice that of Japan and the countries now in the European economic community combined. Between 1950 and the end of the 1970s, the U.S. proportion of world product and of world manufacturing production fell. But since the mid to late 1970s, the American share of world product has been steady at about 23 percent, much lower than the 38 or 40 percent or even 50 percent that have been, have been estimated for the 1950-55 period, uh, but steady and by far the largest single, uh, single actor if you don't count the European community uh, as a single actor. Uh, taking the early 1950s as a base point, then, there's been a decline of American power if we define power not as influence uh, but as preponderance of material resources. But that decline has occurred from a starting point uh, at which most of the world was still suffering from the devastation of war. Part of the decline, at, at any rate, can be interpreted as a reflection of underlying factor endowments temporarily disrupted outside of North America by World War II and its aftermath. So there has been a decline, uh, but it's certainly not precipitous. Finally, the sources of the challenge to American economic dominance have to be specified carefully. This is often not done. That challenge never came from the Soviet Union, despite what was frequently believed during the height of the Cold War. Robert Gilpin wrote in 1981 uh, that the Soviet Union was the rival power uh, which, the, which, which might supersede the United States. Now, that judgment looks incredibly anachronistic today. Since the 1970s, the United States has kept pace with Europe in manufacturing production, proportion of world product, and competitiveness in leading high-tech industry. The erosion of American material dominance does not result from European, much less Soviet, economic prowess, but from a combination of internal political and economic problems in the United States.
and a, a remarkable rise of productivity in East Asia. Seems to me that the two key problems are America's huge public sector deficits and low private savings rates, which have combined to make the United States reliant to an unprecedented degree for a great power on investment from abroad. In Gilpin's phrase, I, I think it's a good phrase, the U.S. is an indebted hegemon, uh, the first one in, in, in history. Between 1983 and 1990, the United States incurred a cumulative current account deficit, that is, we borrowed from abroad roughly $800 billion. It was extraordinary. No great power has ever had the boldness or foolhardiness to do this uh, before in world history. Uh, we are the only superpower, if we are one, uh, which is, instead of being a creditor, uh, a huge, in fact, by far, as you know, the world's biggest debtor. At the same time, a series of well-publicized reports has revealed the low academic performance of American secondary school students, excepting those in this, uh, in this room, all of you who were, presumably, uh, at some point, secondary school students. Uh, and this, this low performance has, has ominous implications for United States competitiveness in future decades. Whether we will restore our ability to compute in sophisticated uh, uh, segments or industries is open to question. Uh, and it's quite clear that in the last 15 years, it's, it's been Japan and East Asia that have made the most rapid progress in high technology competition. So the general pattern of power diffusion is clear. The United States financial strength has been weakened more than its manufacturing productivity or its share of world product. Significant relative gains have been made uh, recently only by Japan and East Asia, not by Europe, much less by the socialist countries who are falling farther and farther behind. Europe, however, is, is a more effective economic actor than before because of the increased size of, of, of the European community and the increased coherence of its policy. Uh, so we can now speak, as we couldn't have 30 years ago, of a tripolar world political economy. European pole, Japanese pole, and an American pole. With the European community as the largest entity, if, if you count it as a whole, and East Asia the most rapidly growing one. However, neither Europe nor Japan has the, has the capability to be a, a, a political or military leader in the 1990s. A European politician was quoted recently as saying that Europe is an economic giant, a political dwarf, and a military worm. So when one takes it into account multiple sources of power, both tangible and intangible, the United States remains the strongest actor in world politics. But the margin of its dominance over Europe and Japan has become slimmer. Let me talk now about interdependence and limitations on the efficacy of military power. Because we come down now to the question, well, how much good, from the point of view of US influence in the world economy, does the undoubted fact that American military capabilities are greater than any other countries have. Deterrence is difficult in world politics. Forcing others to act in desired ways through military threats is much harder. We couldn't deter Iraq, at least we didn't successfully deter Iraq, uh, but it's much more difficult to get others to do what we want them to do uh, if they've already occupied a territory or simply have other political objectives. And if it's difficult to use threats of force on military issues, it's almost impossible to translate military force in, into political influence on most of the issues dividing the countries of the tripolar world economy. And nothing, in my view, that happened in the winter of 1990 uh, should alter the, this judgment. It was always clear that if unchecked, aggressive states could seize their neighbor's territory. It was always clear that the only effective counter to military force is, unfortunately, military force. Uh, and in that sense, military force is not obsolete in world politics and will probably never become so. But the events of winter 1990 may, it seems to me, render force less rather than more likely to be used in the next 10 or 20 years. Indeed, the failure of Iraq's aggression toward, toward Kuwait may well reinforce limitations and, and inhibitions on the use of offensive 
military force that seemed to be uh, becoming somewhat tattered in the last 20 years. Opportunistic states with large conventional armies may well be restrained from attacking their neighbors by recollections of what happened to Iraq. While the United States, if its leaders are, are sensible, will recognize that its own forces are much more useful to deter and if necessary to thwart such attacks than they would be to intervene in the internal governance of foreign states. Over the next decade, U.S. credibility in, in deterrence will be higher than it was in the previous decade. Therefore, it may be more, it may be easier to deter the future Iraqs of this world from at least conventional attacks across uh, sovereign states' uh, recognized borders. As I already have mentioned, uh, threats or promises concerning the use of force, however, are very difficult to use on issues of trade barriers, macroeconomic policy coordination, or environmental protection. Movements of aircraft carriers will not open markets, alter exchange rates, or preserve tropical rainforests from destruction. So the knowledge of which states have the most military power is not the magic key that unlocks the secrets of world politics, as many people in Washington are talking now as if it were. It's very significant. It's significant in stopping aggression, maybe deterring aggression, but it doesn't solve most of the problems that governments are concerned with, and it has relatively little leverage on solving most of those problems. Now, those issues have, have increased greatly, that is, non-military issues, issues on which military force is not very effective, have become much more important in, in the last 40 years, rather continuously so, as interdependence has grown. Interdependence means that societies, firms, groups, and governments are both sensitive to actions of others and vulnerable to changes in their relationships induced by others' behavior. Interdependence means that we affect each other more across national boundaries than used to be the case. During the Cold War, trade grew at a, at a greater rate in almost every year than did world output. Between 1960 and 1986, foreign direct investment by developed market economies grew even more rapidly, 25 times in nominal terms. Shifts in, in energy consumption and production increased the dependence of Europe, Japan, and North America on oil from the Middle East. Reliance on air, on air transport increased sensitivity and vulnerability to terrorism against commercial aircraft. Increased concern about environmental issues, raised perceived interdependence about threats to the ozone layer, about global warming, and about transboundary pollution. Influence on these global issues depends very little on military power and a great deal on specific patterns of capabilities that are specific to issue areas. It's very hard to translate influence on one into influence on another. Oil exports, the size of one's import market for manufactured goods, uh, possession of rainforests, or link to, and, and location of coastline uh, may, may all be sources of influence on one issue or another. But it's hard to exchange these resources for one another. They're not like money. Coastline was valuable to states in the law of the sea negotiation. The more coastline you had, the more effective you could be because you could threaten that you would simply expropriate, as was done in fact, the, uh, the seas off, off your coast. Uh, but, it's, but a long coastline won't buy you lower oil prices. You know, a long coastline plus $21 will buy you a barrel, a barrel of oil. And uh, $21 will buy you a barrel of oil without a long coastline. Having a big import market could indirectly confer influence over a climate change regime, but very delicate diplomacy would, would be needed to make that, make that connection. What interdependence means then is first that military power is not effective on a lot of issues that we care about. And secondly, it means that even great powers can't act effectively alone. To regain some influence over events, governments and firms have to collaborate with one another. They have to sacrifice their unilateral freedom of action for some degree of mastery over transnational flows of capital, goods, technology, ideas, and people. But since sovereignty remains the basis of world society, sovereign states are still the fundamental acting unit 
the sources of effective control over relevant state policy remain fragmented. And as issues subject to interdependence proliferate, these power sources become more diffuse. They not only lie in the hands of more states, within states they're controlled by more different types of actors. So the general pattern in the last 40 years has been one of great difficulty in, in using force, except for deterrence, which is tricky enough, and a diffusion of power as the number of issues about which states care uh, has proliferated. During the Cold War, however, this, this diffusion of power was somewhat restrained by the fact that military force was a source of political influence for the United States in one very important respect. Since Europe and Japan relied on the American nuclear umbrella and substantial number of American troops for their security, or at least for their confidence in their own security from the Soviet Union, they had to worry that the United States might either deliberately or as a, a result of popular pressure reduce its protection for them if conflicts on other issues became too intense. Insofar as the Soviets become less of a threat, this source of, of U.S. influence may actually decline in the coming New World Order. Uh, and it's independent of the extent to which the U.S. Uh, is dominant. In fact, the irony is that the U.S. being more dominant militarily may find that this military uh, uh, force has less influence over the European and Japanese because the threat has disappeared. Let me talk now about recent events. That is the transformation of political structure uh, with, the, with the collapse or near collapse of the Soviet state. Because I, I want to put those against the background of these two other trends. The gradual but by no means precipitous decline in American, in American economic capabilities relatively and the, the increase of, of interdependence and the diffusion of power over issue areas that that represents. When commentators write about the end of the Cold War, they may refer to changes in relations between the superpowers, which have recently been marked by remarkable cooperation, as you know, especially in the war against Iraq. Such cooperation, however, may wane. Uh, we see signs of Soviet second thoughts already. But what distinguishes the present period, in, in my view, from previous periods of detente, as in the early 1970s, also periods of cooperation among superpowers, is the revelation of Soviet economic, political, and, and military weakness. The withdrawal of Soviet power from Central and Eastern Europe and the reunification of Germany. These are fundamental changes, much more fundamental than the change in relations between the superpowers which can blow hot or blow cold. If the Soviet Union, or at least Russia, uh, linked to the Ukraine and Belarus, manages to maintain its political integrity and remain a great power, conflicts of interest with Europe and the United States will undoubtedly persist. And depending on domestic politics, leadership policies, and events elsewhere, they may be more or less severe. However, they'll be fundamentally different from the context of the Cold War period, because the Soviet Union will face a strong reunited Germany with Poland between them. The Cold War began over the division of Germany and the Soviet takeover of Eastern Europe. The reversal of these actions marks its end. Whatever the pattern of the future, it's going, to, it's going to be different. It's not going to be a return to the Cold War. We're not living through the late 70s again when you seem to have a return to the Cold War from a period of detente. Not only has this, have the Soviets withdrawn from Eastern Europe, the Soviet Union status as a great power is in jeopardy for both economic and political reasons. Its capacity to produce technologically sophisticated commercial products keeps falling. Uh, it, it's, industrial production seems to be declining and the performance of its uh, distribution system has worsened markedly since 1989. <clears throat> At the same time, its little, uh, coherence is threatened both horizontally by regional conflicts among and within the various republics, and vertically by political conflicts between traditional organs of the Soviet state and newly organized political forces, the Gorbachev-Yeltsin quarrel, for example. The Soviet Union uh, faces the danger, as, as we all now know, of collapse and civil war. Now, if the Soviet Empire had collapsed in 1953 and Germany had been reunited then, when the East Germans had a revolution, uh, which was put down, the world would indeed have become unipolar. That is, there would have been the U.S. as the sole superpower. 
Uh, the U.S. At, at that time having, as we saw, uh, double the GNP of its, of its current major rivals put together. It would, however, be very misleading to characterize the world of, of the 1990s uh, in this way. Of course, the United States is the only state with the capacity to exercise global political leadership, as Joseph Nye has argued. But the more sweeping claims of less cautious commentators carried away by euphoria during the first phase of, of, of the Persian Gulf, the first phase being the war, uh, must be rejected. Charles Krautheimer has recently claimed that the United States is, quote, the only country with a military, diplomatic, political, and economic assets to be a decisive player in any conflict in whatever part of the world it chooses to involve itself. That's a statement of great, great hubris. The chief error in this assertion, there are many errors, is the word decisive. The United States has the greatest capability of any state to intervene on a global basis, although one may doubt that its military power could be very effective on the Asian landmass, away from access to its sea power. But its action alone can hardly be decisive, as the war in Vietnam should have taught us. Other states' interests must be engaged along with those of, of the United States, and the United States does not have the ability to create regimes in its image, except where it is willing to concentrate a very large portion of its, of its resources in a small area, and even then, uh, it has very limited capability. We see right now the United States' ability to control who runs Iraq, who, uh, what the shape of Iraq is, is very, very limited. Uh, the Iranians may have somewhat more influence in, in some respects than we have, even though it's quite clear that their military power uh, is, uh, is tiny compared to American military power. If we consider issues other than the most severe crises, such as the Gulf War, the image of unipolarity, one supreme dominant country, becomes even more tarnished. Viewing world politics as a fragmented mosaic of issue areas and regions, we should think about the world as a, as a world of asymmetrical multipolarity rather than a world of unipolarity. That is, there are lots of different centers of power in the world, but they're not e equally important. The United States is the most important of those centers on the largest number of issues. That doesn't mean that it dominates on any issues except those in which military force can be brought to bear uh, directly. No, so no small number of states in the current world, much less a single power, can determine political outcomes on all important issues of world politics. So having, having set this stage, let me ask, the, ask my, my final major question, that is, what is the role of multilateral institutions, whether it's the European community or, or the United Nations or the World Bank or the International Monetary Fund, those are all examples of what I mean by multilateral institutions, What's the role of multilateral institutions in this picture? What should their role be in American, in American policy? I've argued that the post-Cold War system is fragmented by issue area and characterized by asymmetrical multipolarity. Even if the Soviet Union, or perhaps Russia, regains its strength, the world political economy will revolve around the triangle of Europe, North America, and Japan. Military power is likely to become uh, more concentrated in the advanced countries, as advanced technology plays an increasingly important role, but the purposes to which military power can be put will be restricted. The United States will not be able to dictate the rules on most issues, because its resources, although great, will be limited. And there is no assurance that the American public will be willing to devote them in a sustained way to foreign policy in the absence of a credible security threat. Structural changes in the world imply policy change. During the Cold War, the United States exercised leadership and paid the price for it. Indeed, I would characterize U.S. behavior during the Cold War as unconditional leadership. That is, the United States accepted a world role, it indeed welcomed a world role. Yet the U.S. frequently sought to bolster regimes that would depend on American support, rather than only offering American support reluctantly uh, in response to requests from foreign governments. Congress and the public occasionally grumbled, but except where the human costs were high, as in Vietnam, they acquiesced. So we had this policy of unconditional leadership, uh, captured best by John F. Kennedy in his inaugural address, saying the United States will bear any burden, pay any price, 
for liberty. A continuation of this pattern in the 1990s is unlikely for reasons both of security interests and economic capability. The collapse of Soviet power in Eastern Europe and the likely disappearance of the Soviet Union as a superpower, seriously threatening American interests, make it hard to argue that the United States must continue its role as a global policeman in the interest of our own security. It is the most fundamental principle of foreign policy that a nation's capabilities must be consistent with the interests it seeks to promote and defend. But the United States no longer has the economic capabilities to finance uh, the role of global policemen itself, especially in view of our internal and external debt burden and political constraints on raising taxation. We notice that this, this wonderful spectacle of, of the U.S. going hat in hand to its allies uh, for their payments uh, on the war, uh, $54 billion promised. Uh, the war got won a little too fast from this point of view. Uh, and now the U.S. Is, uh, is talking tough about making sure people, people pay up on their promises. It's a striking case of playing the role of policemen but not being able or willing uh, to finance it. The habits of hegemony, the habits of dominance, inculcated for 40 years in the American elite, will change. They'll change because interests have changed and capabilities have changed and nothing anybody can say is going is to alter those two fundamental facts. The question is how the habits of hegemony will change and with what effects on world order. One possibility is the U.S. could decide to go back to acting unilaterally uh, and go back to acting uh, in a protectionist, I won't quite say isolationist way, but in a, with a very limited view of what its interests are. The U.S. could reduce the scope of its commitments. The U.S. could come home America, as George McGovern put it in 1972. It could let Europe defend itself, which it could quite well do now against any threats from the Soviet Union. Uh, it could adopt a serious domestic energy policy to reduce dependence on, on the Middle East. And our dependence on the Middle East is relatively small, potentially at least, compared to the European and Japanese, since we both have energy resources and a huge energy resource, which is the waste that we now engage in, which could be, uh, could be cut back dramatically, thus saving uh, oil. The U.S. could withdraw militarily from the Persian Gulf, only perhaps retaining a shield of nuclear deterrence to protect Israel. It could dramatically reduce its military presence in East Asia, leaving its base in the Philippines without seeking a replacement and disengaging from the alliances on the Asian mainland. The United States will, could continue to protect Japan uh, with its nuclear deterrent, but would no longer guarantee Japanese access to Persian Gulf oil through the shipping lines or to secure supply lines from Europe to the Middle East. Now these actions would be consistent with the traditional behavior of great powers, defending their own vital interests. Shouldn't be discounted. That is, our interests are now less worldwide than they were. We have no, no, we have no challenger anymore. So much of the, of the rationale for the American global role uh, is undercut. Uh, and a powerful case could be made for a policy of retrenchment uh, and domestic priorities. And these actions would indeed be consistent with the way great powers have usually behaved. That's often forgotten, uh, but certainly until 1945, this, would have been, this is the way the British would have behaved, yeah, not faced uh, with a threat uh, to their vital interests. However, these actions would be inconsistent with the practices of superpowers uh, during, during the last 40 years, in particular, inconsistent with the US practice and with American habits. And I don't think we'll see them, certainly from the, from, uh, from the present generation of American leaders who are flushed with success uh, with these habits. Successful states rarely change policy uh, in the wake of further success. Now, some of, the, some of these policies, such as the development of an effective domestic energy policy, would be long overdue, in my opinion. However, restricting the scope of, of U.S. commitments would also incur serious costs for the United States. As recent events indicate, without extensive U.S. involvement, there is a great risk that determined and aggressive leadership of a well-organized and coherent state, whether Iraq, to, uh, whether Iran 10 years ago, Iraq today, or Iran uh, 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 five years hence, could dominate the entire oil-producing areas 
along the Persian Gulf. And such an event would certainly undermine one of the pillars of American influence in, in the post-war order, that is, control over the flow of oil supplies to Europe and Japan from the Persian Gulf. If the United States were to retrench, therefore, its influence with, with its allies would surely suffer. That bargain has been based partly on what we just saw the last few months, the U.S. guaranteeing access to oil to Europe and Japan. Uh, Japan, in particular, would have much less incentive to accommodate American financial markets and the trade demands of the U.S. government. Global issues such as, as environmental protection might become much harder to cope with in a genuinely multipolar system in which America could not count on deference to its wishes from its allies. Serious domestic adjustments, including energy conservation and an increase in, in the domestic savings rate, would almost surely be required. Adjustment to more protectionist policies by U.S. trade partners, particularly in Europe, might be necessary. The promised domestic rewards of retrenchment would be unlikely, therefore, to be realized. There wouldn't be a lot of payout uh, to the populace. In the long run, much could be said for energy conservation and increased savings. But in the short run, forcing painful adjustment onto the American public via taxes, inflation, or other means of reducing living standards is costly to politicians. Maybe good for the country, but it's costly to politicians. Negative reactions to the U.S. policy shifts by its tripolar partners could easily lead to retaliation uh, by the United States and its slide to protectionism, as urged recently, for example, by the corporate leaders of Chrysler and Ford um, and by the United Auto Workers. A, st a strategy of retrenchment has risky implications, both at, at the domestic political level and for long-term national strategy. A more sensible alternative, in my view, to the unilateral reduction of American commitments is some form of joint leadership. Uh, that is, we're not going to have, it seems to me, unilateral leadership. We're not going to have the U.S. as the world policeman anymore, or unconditional hegemony. Uh, and I doubt if we're going to have, I think we shouldn't have, a, a, a policy of sharp retrenchment, even though some signs might point in that direction. I would suggest a more sensible alternative then is some form of joint leadership. Under such a system, other states would make greater contributions to the maintenance of world order, a prosperous international economy, and an, an effective international environmental policy. Now, only would Japan and the European community make greater contributions. They would have to be willing to take political initiatives to exercise leadership. For its part, the United States would have to accept that it could not always play the major role in shaping joint policies nor would its leaders always be at the center of the photograph of the G7 summits, about the center of international attention. American willingness to let Europe take the lead in East European reconstruction is a welcome, perhaps somewhat faint, sign now that at least on some issues, the Bush administration may begin to think in joint leadership terms rather than leader-follower terms. Now, joint leadership requires multilateral institutions. If the United States is, is to reduce its costly commitments, without risking trade wars, it will need to learn better how to use international regimes, international organizations and rules to further its own policy objectives. Doing so requires building on shared interests where it is feasible for states to gain jointly from cooperation. Where possible, new international functions should be assumed by existing international organizations so that it's usually easier incrementally to extend the activities of an ongoing institution if it operates relatively well than to construct and, and obtain widespread agreement on a new one. Considerable attention has to be paid to the problem of compliance with rules. It's easier to pass rules in an international institution than it is to ensure their compliance. We cannot think clearly, then, about state strategies in contemporary world politics if we take uh, the notion of joint leadership seriously without taking into account the role played by multilateral institutions. Appropriate state strategies depend on institutional capabilities and expectations about their stability and prospects for growth, as much as they rely on capabilities controlled unilaterally by states. That is, access to and influence in international organizations is on many issues a more important resource for the United States than its military power. European stability is closely linked to international institutions. Uh, in NATO, the European Community, uh, the 2 plus 4 process, the, uh, the Conference on Security and Cooperation in Europe. 
And when state strategies change, as those of the United States will have to in the next decade, given its resources and its interests, multilateral institutions could play a decisive role in cushioning the effects of change and managing a transition, which is what we're going to be living through, a transition between American dominance, or however brief it was, uh, to new patterns of leadership to fit changed political and economic structures. Now, the indispensability of multilateral institutions for joint leadership does not imply that the United States must necessarily rely implicitly on the United Nations. International organizations whose members prefer antithetical policies can contribute to stalemate rather than to effective action. And this stalemate can be compounded when the leadership of these organizations is weak and their bureaucracies of low competence. Unfortunately, those all apply to the United Nations most of the time. Some elements of the UN system have been quite effective, notably the UN Environmental Program, uh, the loosely affiliated World Bank and IMF, and depending on the political conjuncture, the Security Council. Others, I won't mention them all, have more checkered histories. To recommend that U.S. policy work through multilateral institutions, as I do, is not to argue that all international relations are, are equally worthwhile or that for all purposes the United Nations um, is the organization of choice. I just read a piece by Brian Urquhart.